Hey guys, this is Melissa with Love Covered Life, and over the past few weeks, I've been doing a series on the atonement, answering the question, what did Jesus really do on the cross? And today, I'm going to be addressing a topic of discussion that came up in my comments this week. My brother Stephen Fraser and I were discussing the topic of death and hell being cast into the lake of fire, and I mentioned that the illusion of death was being cast into the lake of fire, which is a representation of God, and that's a whole other topic. But then he commented and said, did Jesus overcome an illusion, or was it a real enemy? So in this video, we're going to talk about the question, is death an illusion or a real enemy that Jesus overcame on the cross? In order to answer this question, we need to go back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapters 2 and 3. And in the story of Eve eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we will discover um, what the condition is that Jesus came to save us from and what it is that he actually overcame on the cross. So those who understand the Bible literally take the Garden of Eden story to be literal. As in, there was a literal tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and that Eve ate a literal fruit off of that tree. And when she ate this fruit, she plunged the world into sin. How? because she disobeyed God's command not to eat from that tree and she literally ate a piece of fruit that God told her not to eat. I'll be honest, even as a child, this didn't seem logical to me. Why would God test them in this way? Is blind obedience really that important to God? Didn't he give us minds to question and think critically with? And even if this was the case, then why would the fate of the whole human race depend on whether or not they ate a piece of fruit? Why wouldn't God make the command that would make or break the human race? Well, I don't know, maybe loving each other or taking care of the earth. Wouldn't that make more sense? From this literal Garden of Eden story, we create a whole philosophy around sin being disobedience to God, deserving of punishment. And we also swing the door wide open for ideas like original sin and total depravity that are taught nowhere in the Bible. The fact is, unless you are raised in fundamentalist Christianity and spoon-fed these ideas from the time you were a child, it is clear that this story is not meant to be taken literally. Why was the tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Is it normal for trees to have deeply philosophical names in literal stories? Clearly, the tree represents something. The story is symbolic. Most people believe that when Eve ate the fruit, she suddenly had the ability to now do evil, whereas before she only had the ability to do good, hence the fall into sin. In reality, what it says is that her eyes were opened to know both good and evil. It's about being able to see or perceive a difference between good and evil. It's about being able to experience a contrast that did not previously exist in her awareness. Before she ate the fruit, she saw and experienced only God, only good, only light, only love. After she ate the fruit, she saw and experienced duality, God and Satan, good and evil, light and darkness, love and fear. Genesis 2.25 says that before Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they were naked and not ashamed. This represents spiritual innocence, which is the state that Jesus says we have to return to if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Who else can you think of that can be naked and not ashamed? Obviously, a little child. In Genesis 3.7, it says that both of their eyes were opened and they realized that they were naked. This represents innocence lost, guilt, shame, judgment of themselves. The result of entering a different level of spiritual consciousness referred to in Genesis as death. In Genesis 2.17, God tells Adam and Eve that they may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. 
This death is a symbolic representation of what is commonly referred to today as separation consciousness. Death is the opposite of life. Death is the perception that we are separated from our source of life, incomplete, lacking, alone, or naked. It is this perception of separation from the source of life, or God, which all sin derives from. Believing that we are separate and incomplete is what leads to greed and lust, which leads to all power struggles and control and manipulation and abuse and oppression. Believing the illusion that you are your own disconnected self is what leads to everything from pride to defensiveness to fear and anxiety and depression to judgment of your neighbor. Keep on going down that path and you get to hostility, aggression, violence. All sin is the result of believing that we are separate from each other and from our creator. And Jesus taught that it is a state of mind that needs healing. The story in the Garden of Eden illustrates that at some point in our development, we chose against God's better judgment to enter into a state of duality or a state of contrast, maybe for our own spiritual growth, maybe because we were deceived, but whatever the reason, this is where we find ourselves today. And as many near-death experience accounts demonstrate, God uses even this for good, because that's what God does. He takes everything and he works it for good. And what we have here on earth now, because of the, the state of duality or contrast that we find ourselves in here, we have what's called spiritual catalyst that allows us to grow spiritually at rapid levels. For instance, how do you grow really strong in love? How do you grow to understand what forgiveness truly is? Put yourself in a situation where people are gonna hurt and mistreat you, and then you're gonna be forced to learn forgiveness in a way that you never would have if nobody had ever wronged you. How do you learn about your true nature of oneness and wholeness and completeness and love? Put yourself in a situation where you're gonna feel like you lack something, where you're gonna feel like you need something, where you're gonna suffer. It will cause you to appreciate your true nature and to come to know it and understand it in a way that you never would have otherwise. And in experiencing these things, these things that are the opposite of the nature of God, the opposite of our true nature, eventually each one of us will reach a point where we are ready to be awakened to the truth that this cannot be real, that there has to be more to life than this right? There has to be more than an endless cycle of suffering. And this is where Jesus came in. Jesus is the Son of God. He is a person living in perfect awareness of who he is in relationship with God and in perfect wholeness and oneness in divine love. Jesus came to show us the true nature of God and in so doing to show us our true nature as sons and daughters of God. Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy, that is death, and the world systems that keep people in bondage to death, that keep people believing that they are lacking and incomplete and broken. Jesus came to offer his flesh that the world may live because in his life, death, and resurrection, he defeated the great lie that death has any power over us. So did Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection defeat a real enemy or an illusion? The answer is yes and yes. First, Jesus defeated a real enemy. The enemy he defeated is death. The enemy he defeated is the perception that we are separate from God and everything that flows from that. Pain and sorrow and disease and suffering and oppression and violence. These things, the experience of these things is very real. The experience of physical and psychological and spiritual death here is a very real experience. And Jesus took all of that upon himself and overcame it on the cross. When we put all of our madness on him, we put our sin and our corruption and our violence on Jesus. He took it. 
He bore it in his body on the cross. He followed our illusions, our madness through to the full conclusion. He literally physically died. And as he died, he forgave. And this is the way that he defeated our sins. Love covers a multitude of sins and he covered our sins with love. Showing us that the way to defeat death is through unconditional love and forgiveness. He defeated death by covering and filling all of our sin, our madness, our illusions with the light of his love and forgiveness and extinguishing it, defeating its power over our minds and hearts, freeing us to rise with him into the perfection of unity in the love of God. Jesus' message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. Repent means change your mind, change the way that you think, change the way that you see and perceive. Because the kingdom of heaven, which is a state of awareness in which you exist in oneness with God within your heart, is here and it is available to anyone. Jesus brought healing for hurt, peace for violence, love for fear, and illumination for our illusions. And he showed us that the way to defeat death, which is a very real experience here and which the Bible does refer to as our enemy, is through filling it with the awareness of love. And second, yes, Jesus overcame an illusion. Although a better word than overcome here would be exposed. Jesus exposed the illusion. The illusion of death. The illusion that we could ever be truly separate from God, our source. The very fact that we exist shows that we are one with God. Because to be separate from our source of life means that we would no longer exist. Our existence would be extinguished. God is the source of all life. You cannot exist apart from God. Jesus, in his life, demonstrated and displayed perfect oneness with God. He forgave sin. He healed disease. He raised the dead. He calmed storms. He created abundance. In short, he dissolved everything that is perceived out of a separation consciousness. Everything that comes from lack, brokenness, and incompleteness. In his death and resurrection, he showed us that he was whole and perfect and complete. That he was impervious to offense and hurt. In his death, he allowed the culmination of the world's sin to be committed against him. Because the point of the resurrection was to show that even when we did our worst, and our worst corruption, our worst sin, crucifying the Son of God, the culmination of all sins ever committed, we could not touch him. We did not hurt the Son of God because someone living in perfect unity with God cannot be hurt. He was impervious to our worst attempts because he is whole and perfect and complete in divine love, perfectly one with the Father. And he did this for us to reveal to us our true nature. John 17 verses 21 through 24. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. When he says here that he wants them to be with him where he is, Clearly, he's not talking about a physical place because they are standing right there with him. What he's talking about is a state of consciousness where he exists, what he refers to as the kingdom of heaven, in which he sees only the glory of God and where he experiences perfect oneness with divine love. What we truly are cannot be hurt, cannot be attacked, cannot be sinned against cannot die. 
And in this knowledge, we return to a state of spiritual innocence, knowing that only God exists and that we are one with God and that we are perfect and complete and whole in that oneness and that anything that could threaten us is an illusion. The resurrection is being raised from death separation consciousness into life, awareness of our true nature as children of God. And this is what the salvation experience taught by the Christian church is all about. Regeneration, the new birth, awakening to the awareness of God within us, and then sanctification, growing into the likeness of Christ. In John 12, Jesus speaks of his death as if it is his glory. We talk about Jesus' glorification in the church as if it's something that happens after he returns to heaven, when actually Jesus said his death was when he was glorified. And the reason why is because, verse 23, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. So Jesus entered into death to bring us life. And when you study the parables that he taught and the teachings that he gave, it becomes very clear that what Jesus came to save us from is our own internal state. It's not something out here. It's not an external enemy. The enemy is in our minds. Our hearts must be awakened and our awareness must be shifted and our minds need to be healed. Jesus defeated sin by healing it. So he did it as a demonstration. Yes, he overcame the illusion, but he also physically shifted something in the spiritual world where he actually overcame death and made the life and the awareness of the life of God and that connection with the life of God available to us, breaking the bondage that our illusions had over our own minds. So hopefully that makes sense. Again, this is another one of those super confusing topics and also very controversial topics. So I'm sure there's many of you who won't agree with me on this. Feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments. Let's get a, a good discussion going on this topic. Be loved, be happy, be at peace, and thank you for watching.